Dum de dum. G'day, ladies and gentlemen. This is uh, Barney here, and I've got my mate from across the Tasman, Bill Daly. Welcome, Bill. Hello, Barney. No worries. It's, um, it's a couple of weeks since I've seen you, Barney, and I hope you've been well. <laughs> we, we have, we have. Thank you. We we all have over here, uh, mum included, uh, wife Beata, and um, I've got my sister across and her husband from Tasmania. So oh, uh, so we've got guests in the house. It's it's lovely having them. Lovely seeing them. Yeah. And a couple of weeks back, I had my younger brother and his wife and daughter and future son-in-law. They were across from uh, Canberra. And Darwin, so it was lovely seeing them as well. So it's a good time of year to uh, catch up with family and that sort of stuff. <laughs> it um, is a great time of the year to catch up. It is, and it is. It's a time of the year that reminds us of um, something a little deeper that ought to belong, ought to, ought to play a role in our lives, yes. That's mm. right, that's right. I mean, the, the reason for the season, this is the, uh, this is the celebration, the Christian celebration, that uh, God himself came as flesh and dwelt among us and uh, the creator of all and what a wonderful message that is what a wonderful christmas message the mass of christ what a wonderful message absolutely mm, I, I agree yeah good on you um okay just to um just to give the everyone a heads up this will be the last across the tasman time for a yarn forum for this year and uh, and we loved having you and we loved having bill and I'm just giving you a heads up that this will be. So, uh, yeah, pay attention and uh, we might get some real gems out of it. See how we go. <laughs> All right. No worries. Now, Bill, before the before I hit the record button, you were talking about um, mainstream media and its function and role in society. And I thought that was that you made some very interesting and telling comments. And I wonder if you'd uh, uh, bring the audience up to speed on your thoughts, please. Um, well, it's not just my thoughts. It's it's m many people are looking at this, but in my view, the role of the mass media, um, its primary role, um, whether it happened deliberately or not, has been to protect the real power that operates in the world in our age, and that is the power of finance. Mm -hmm. um, simply by never talking about it. I'm not saying it doesn't talk about bank profits. Um, um, that some bank has closed a branch down and um, that kind of thing. But in the background of finance is the fact that the greatest power probably that has ever existed operates and it operates in the world today. And we're led to believe through schooling and the press and, and, and church and all the rest of it that we used to have monarchies, and, and now in the British world we have a constitutional monarchy, um, and, and these people had great power, but this is all gone, and, and we've got democracy, which is a load of codswallop. Mm -hmm. We haven't got any democracy at all, which, mm -hmm. which means rule by the people, if you go back to the original Greek meaning. Mm -hmm. We've got a hidden power, and the media never exposes that. I would go so far as to say the media operates in a way as if it has been set up as an agency to protect that ranking power and it protects it by never referring to the essence of it, which is the creation of money. Um, we, we, we've all been led to believe that such a thing as the Australian dollar, New Zealand dollar, English pound, American dollar, Japanese yen, but the banks create that and they only loan it to society. So really money in the modern world belongs to the banking system, is owned by the banking system, is issued by the banking system on the terms decided by the banking system. Mm -hmm. And this is behind the day-to-day -day administration of banking. And like yourself, I'm influenced by the social credit movement and, and, and the work that Clifford Hugh Douglas did mm -hmm. 100 years ago um, when he started his, um, his research. Um, and as an engineer, he looked into the banking system and... Mm -hmm. The, the price system, the cost system, the employment system, and everything else related to that. And he pointed out some faults in it that, um, well, he was easily able to predict once he looked into how the financial system it, it operates, how money's created and issued, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that we would have ever-growing debt. And mm -hmm. this would put pressure on societies mm -hmm. and, and is the reason why there's such a push for exports. It's mm -hmm. because there's always an insufficiency of funds. Mm. Um, is it just, and, is it, I mean, <clears throat> my understanding is it's just not funds because the banks can issue as much funds as they like, but
but the fact is the funds are always in the form of a debt <clears throat> and you never money actually issued. yeah you never actually issued new money in the form of credit and Absolutely. so it becomes a <clears throat> it's an anomaly but uh, the credit creation is only part of the picture it's an enormous power of the banks in this credit creation but it's also as i understand it that there's another facet to this and that is that when they when they accept bonds from a government and the government signs bonds into being to the banking fraternity there's a there's a there's a promise to pay based on future taxation and so it's an expansion of the money supply but the fact is that with this power that the banks have to create money they actually can have governments beholding to them and so they can actually have a vested interest in things that are well past their um, acceptable level of involvement and so they're actually not only are they have this ability to create um, money from nothing actually just by putting figures in a book and transferring it around between computers but they also have this power to influence policy and the policy is over and above governments and that inordinate amount of power causes governments to go cap in hand to the banking fraternity so where we think we've got democracy you mentioned democracy in the vote this power that's there the governments themselves are more or less like the human resources in a company they're the human resources that actually try and keep the troops under control and they're they're a, they're a barrier and so are the mainstream media. They're, they're different layers or barriers between the community, the individual, and this power, this absolute power that's in the, uh, it's in the uh, credit creation, in the money system. Ab absolutely. You, you, mm. you nailed it on the head. I, I couldn't put it so well. Mm -hmm. um, and the hidden, hiddenness or hidden nature of that um, power um, is, is, it, is a great strength for it. And a weakness for everybody else. Um, the reality is the world. The world is extremely rich in in all the resources we require, mm -hmm. um, and that's the way God made things. He mm. he, he he didn't he didn't um, put us on on a planet like Mars or the Moon. He put us on on this Earth, and and, and it's it, there is no shortage of the materials we need. Mm -hmm. The financial system operates in a way that. I suppose in one sense there's a philosophy behind it and we could call it puritanism it's certain which i think is the opposite of what christ was about yeah if, if he said that he came that we might have life and have it more abundantly indicates that we're not living up to up to our potential so to speak mm -hmm. um so we get conned into uh, thinking well you know the right thing to do is, is work every day of our lives for all of our lives and, mm -hmm. and retirement ages are being increased by governments because they um, they say they haven't got the funds to to um, um, give people a retirement benefit at, at an earlier age, and governments are always short on money. Mm -hmm. And and Doug Douglas showed um, mathematically, and 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 from the point of view of, of an engineer as well, that there is a fault, and debt increases all the time, and the banks make up for that debt by issuing sufficient money, but they only issue it to governments, individuals, businesses as loans. And you're talking about the political influence of the banks. It's enormous political influence because yeah. where does the motivation come um, for, say, globalism, for, for the global institutions? Mm -hmm. um, it didn't come out of nowhere. It's promoted by the by the media, mm -hmm. of course. But, mm -hmm. but uh, what what's what's behind that? Um, there's, there's plenty of things that that um, sh 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 should provide headlines for, for the media, and occasionally they do, like, say, the pollution of the sea and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But often we only get one point of view, and, and it's it's as, as far as solutions go, and that is basically pushing us more towards globalism all the time, as if this is the only way. And, yeah. and these people at the top, I can understand, they have no loyalty to any country. They're, they're basically a global mafia. Mm -hmm. And... Um, via institutions like the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, they have every nation in the world, even nations that weren't industrialized mm -hmm. um, until recently or, or 
barely are industrialized. Some of the African countries, they've never really been industrialized, not in the sense that we understand in the West. And yet they're loaded to the hilt with debt. Mm. And they have to, whatever they produce, they have to try and export. Um, an aspect of this question has been on my mind for the last few days, and I wanted to raise it. And that yeah. is when we come back to the effect that this has on individuals and families and communities, I met a man a couple of days ago and he had on a t-shirt and he, uh, Austria. First of all, I thought it was Australia. When I looked closely, it was Austria. And he said his, his family background is Austrian. Mm -hmm. And he's obviously visited there. And he said one of the really lovely things about it, and I didn't know this, is that there's no shopping on Sundays. Okay. It's regarded as a family day. Yep. You have a break. Dad spends a bit of time with the kids because he doesn't get to do that so much during the week. Mm -hmm. Grandparents, families come together, communities come together. He said, and even on Saturday, there's limited trading. I thought this is fantastic. And I, was, I am aware that Poland has been looking at um, stopping general trading on Sundays. And I think um, um, Hungary as well. Okay. And I am not know if the Russians have looked into this, but I think it's an absolutely fantastic thing. And I recall in the 1990s when New Zealand passed legislation allowing all and sundry to open their doors on Sundays. Yeah. Um, a lot of institutions like clubs, um, the same man that had the Austrian sticker across here said to me that some of his family had involved, been involved in a small yachting club. Yeah. And there were youngsters and older people taught youngsters and, and there was lots of yachts there belonged to this club. And he said in a few years after Sunday trading, it, it closed down. Yeah. And he said a lot of sports clubs have had this, this same um, result because um, people are busy shopping and, and shopping becomes part of their family day. But it's ruined another aspect of society. And that is the more fundamental aspects of stable environment where families have to spend time together want to spend time together and aren't distracted by, oh, let's go shopping. Yeah, mm. yeah, so yeah. It's in shopping mall. Interesting, the um, the balance of things. I think we're, we're losing equilibrium. We're losing balance. We're losing kilter in, in the things that count. Do we actually work to live or do we live to work? And mm, if we live to work, I mean, then that means that, you know, well, you're not going to work Monday and Tuesday because they're slow trading days, but you'll work Saturday and Sunday and I'll pay you no more. And, and the, so, the, so the standards for the shop assistants go down through the floor and then, it's, um, and then it becomes, well, actually, the next is, is because they're all struggling for the markets, is that um, people start working into the evenings and they'll do a... Uh, a, a, a late night shopping once or twice a week, they'll be there manning the store, <clears throat> late night shopping, and they'll they'll get the the quiet time, the Monday morning or the Wednesday morning off, and so their <clears throat> their their hours are all over the place, and it's all to try and increase this thing called sales, all to try mm. and increase sales, and the fact is that we're really being compelled to buy things that we honestly don't need do we really you know we're missing the point here i think we're really missing the point we're not we're not smelling the roses we're not actually enjoying our family we're not pottering around in the garden we've we've just uh, producing 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 and you've got to take into account this to me is the is a significant anomaly and that is that 150 200 years ago 75% of most populations were involved in producing enough food, 75%. And nowadays that number is less than 4%. And so you turn around and you say, well, those 71% of the workforce that are no longer needed in that, in that industry, they need, still need to get access to buy the food. And that's the anomaly. The anomaly is that they can't actually get access to buy the food unless they're doing something else. Because if you don't work, you don't get an income, and that's a real that's a real problem, and and it's this shortage, this chronic chronic shortage of spending power that's affecting everyone. We're all it's like musical chairs. We're all mm. we're all running around in circles trying to get a place on a chair, and there's getting less and less chairs, and the level of indebtedness. I mean, the, this is just going through the roof, and of course, this is the silly season for buying stuff that we probably don't need doing things or whatever 
that we probably don't need to do. And if we just simplified our life a little bit, concentrated on what the season's about. The season is about, it's about actually looking to this life that we've been given. And it is a bountiful life. It is an abundant life. The problem is we haven't actually looked hard or looked hard enough at the systems that we've got operating around us. And are they actually a reflection of what's really going on? Or are they actually sneakingly pilfering everything that we've got? And I call that pilfering the cultural inheritance is actually being appropriated using the financial system. It's being taken from everyone where what we should be doing is just stopping and enjoying it. Let 4% produce all the food we need and let us get sufficient spending power to buy what the producer makes. Just the basics, don't be silly about it, but food is a stable. You need food, you need clothing, you need shelter. And uh, we'll start with food, you know? And that's where, to me, this is where Douglas Social Credit comes into it because it insisted that we should be issued with enough money to balance what industry produces. There needs to be an equilibrium and uh, and that equilibrium is not currently being met. We're, we're being... We're being um, pilfered and we're not paying attention. Absolutely, Barney. Um, Douglas's proposal, which I think was brilliant, but is often not grasped because it was so simple. And the worst group of people to try to convince um, that there is a fault in the financial system, that the financial system is not part of nature, it wasn't part of the original creation, in, in its form, uh, there's two groups. One is the puritanical religious people mm-hmm. who will insist that they're presenting Christianity correctly. And the other is the trained economist. And some accountants fall into that field and, and a few others too. But the trained economist, um, I don't know what's happened. There, there, there may be some rare exceptions, and, and I think there are one or two, but they're very, very rare. Um, the trained economist is 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 really like a high priest for the financial system or a low priest because I've never yet in all the conversations I've had with several been able to break through that barrier that money is not wealth mm-hmm. and all the money in the world is of no use to someone starving in the desert, dying of thirst in the desert. He yeah. needs a glass of water. Therefore, a glass of water is wealth. Mm-hmm. A loaf of bread is wealth. Um, a motor car and some petrol is wealth. A potato is wealth. A house is wealth. Mm-hmm. But money is, uh, it's a, it should be regarded as an accounting system. Strictly, it is an accounting system. Um, and to the extent that it works and enables society to function at the economic level, it does provide for the functioning of the production system and the distribution of that system of, of the products of that system to mm-hmm. consumers yeah however it leaves this terrible trail of debts so douglas's proposal was that um instead of building up debt instead of um, that being financed by further debt from the banks that um at the purchasing level um society be issued with credits equally to every civilian mm-hmm um, whether rich or poor, mm-hmm. and in today's terms, that, that credit would be quite substantial, certainly more than enough for somebody to live reasonably comfortably. Mm-hmm. And it can only be understood if we have some grasp of the reality of the physical world mm-hmm. and get out of our heads mm-hmm. um, and stop thinking of money as wealth, that, that there's limited amounts of it, and the only way to get it is to go to work mm-hmm. um, and 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 the superficial the appallingly superficial argument when when we raise these subjects oh you'll create lots of inflation if you just issue money well the blasted banks issue money all the time that's right every day billions yeah and and they withdraw money out of circulation every time a loan is is repaid yeah is repaid it's yeah. it's, it's out of circulation it no longer exists but is billions, billions and billions being created every day and billions mm-hmm. and billions being withdrawn every day. Mm-hmm. But more is being created, but always is a debt. Mm-hmm. So it shows an appalling ignorance. Mm. Um, and 
I don't want to be hard on people, but a trained economist ought to be willing to look a little bit further into what he's trained. It's, mm. it's, it's, it's one of the problems of modern academic training. I think there's an over um, emphasis sometimes on the particular discipline mm. and, ev and and awareness of everything else can be lost. And, and I'm aware that in days gone by and centuries gone by, people training for the priesthood or, or, or the, and the, the clergy in one form or another often were involved in very practical things. And yeah. seminaries where, yeah. where priests were trained were often based around a farm and a vineyard and that's right and um, yeah. growing food. And mm -hmm. I remember seeing a, a story of a priest when I was a kid. And this chap, while he was in the seminary, was, had learned some mechanics and therefore and, and, and was good at it. And, and he may have even been a mechanic. He had the job of fixing the cars, mm -hmm. but uh, I think very few of them have that kind of input these days. Yeah, I think it's yeah. probably one of the reasons why the clergy, uh, and this I, th I think is appalling, the clergy seem uninterested <coughs> <coughs> in this issue. Mm. Again, with very rare exceptions, we, mm -hmm. we've all known one or two, um, mm. and very, very good clergy. Um, and I think that is the puritanical influence as well, too. Well, you know, life's a bit tough, and mm. and it's the way things are, and you've just. Got I to think the I think the puritanical um, perspective, if you like, the puritanical philosophy, isn't limited to the clergy. I think that no, no, uh, no, no, I think but, that any but, but, anyone who anyone who has a view that um, I mean, let's just let's just play around with a statement: "You shall not work. If you if you shall not work, you shall not eat." Mm. Or labor produces all wealth let's just look at this labor produces all wealth now just recently i've been outside and it was raining and i could be mistaken but i'm pretty sure that the grass is going to grow because it's just been raining and then the rain clouds open up and the sun comes out and not only will the rain complement what's going on but so will the sun now that increase in the grass is real wealth and I haven't done anything to uh, to produce that. Certainly not labour. And then you've got the the air that's blowing, and the soil that's there. And I haven't touched any of that. Now let's just continue on with that theme and say, well, okay, what about the machine? You've got the machine. Now there was a time when all we had was a shovel, or a plow and an ox. And now we've got these gigantic robotic satellite navigation combine harvesters or massive, massive plows and machinery like that that work on the farm, or we go into these uh, car manufacturers that are entirely robotized. And I noticed in Perth uh, recently, they've actually got a, a robot that can lay bricks. It can lay a whole house in three days. A whole house. Not three weeks or, or a month or six weeks. Three days, a whole house. And you look at that and you're thinking, well, obviously labor doesn't produce all wealth because that's not we're not talking um, uh, patents here we're not talking um, you know someone's sort of new technology in a sense we're talking general knowledge that these robots are there and you can build your own robot to do almost anything and and this is this is freely available and it's part of the cultural inheritance and these things can produce so much more now if three or four percent of the population can produce all the food then labour producing all wealth is nonsense. But it's a Puritan statement. And that is that you've got to work or you can't eat. And that's mm. so, so wrong. It's so, so wrong. You've got to look at it and, and take another step back and think, well, if everything is being produced, if everything is being produced that we need, we're not talking smart everything's here or, or whatever the newest fandangled bright coloured lights and all that. We're talking just the basics like the shirt on your back or the shirt on my back and a hat, whatever. The basics. Food in my belly. If they're being produced by 3 or 4% of the population, then surely I should have a claim on that and that the producer is entitled to be able to liquidate all his costs. And that's the purpose of the financial system is so that it balances the producer's production and my desire to consume. And it's this area of distribution 
that's the anomaly. And this is the area that the banks have, if you like, what have they done? They've appropriated the cultural inheritance that belongs to everyone. And that's what Douglas was on about. This this is where it comes to the to the crunch. It's actually if you think about the the trouble that civilizations went through in order to get to the political vote, there was a lot of blood, sweat and tears on that one. And originally, I mean it was at less than a hundred years women have only had the vote. You know, I think it is it started in New Zealand and went to Australia. And um, so less than 100 years, that took a lot of effort over a long period of time to get the vote. And the thing is that that vote is like a little packet of power. And you're handing your packet of power towards your selection of who's going to be the rep- best representative. And it's no different. The money vote is no different. That you're, you're issued or should be issued with a vote. A vote of sufficiency so that you can use these little packets of power to acknowledge that that lot of potatoes that that bloke produced is better than this lot. And I actually don't like potatoes anyway. I want corn or I want carrots or I want this or I want that. And you're voting every single day. And the thing is that we've got to get it in our in our heads that this is our cultural inheritance. It's ours. It doesn't belong to the banks The banks are merely managing numbers. That's all they're doing. They're managing numbers. 97% of all of the money in creation doesn't even take a physical form. It's only ever numbers in books or, or electronic blips in computers. And the banks are managing that. And they claim it, the appropriation of the entire cultural inheritance as their own because they mortgage it. They have a grip of death over the over the either the material assets that people want or bonds against the government and its ability to tax and this does not stop and that's a that's a huge amount of power and we need to bring that power back to the individual in the form of a money vote bill well we we have a money vote to the extent that we have some money um what what is the, re- the reality of the situation is that there's an insufficiency of it in order for an individual or members of a community to buy everything that they themselves have produced or imported into that community. Um, there's a bookkeeping error. Mm-hmm. And when Douglas pointed this out to some bankers and elites of society at his time, he he fairly quickly came to the conclusion that some of them were actually aware mm. of this fault mm-hmm. and uh, they did, they simply didn't believe in the philosophy of freedom they believed in centralized power and and, and bank the banking world has, has played a huge role in, in the um, in the Bolshevik revolution funding mm-hmm. some of the revolutionaries and mm-hmm. ensuring that after the revolution it was an appalling situation I mean millions of people died in it that's right millions of people suffered in concentration care camps call them that Mm -hmm. they were they were death camps they they were often in the early days i think um there was a policy that you you work people and and you minimize the the medical assistance and the food to them and the living conditions to such a standard that about a third died each year and that Mm. that way you're getting rid of the problem of um those who were too weak to carry on working uh, or didn't have the ability to do it, yeah. um, they just got pushed aside. So, mm-hmm. so human life just became part of this giant appalling machine that um, was placed above the human being. And 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 in the West, we were told, oh, there's the, the communists and they're against capitalism and we've, we've got to build up our militaries and they'll build up their military because they're threatened by us. But the financial system enabled that revolution to happen. That's right. And it enabled it to continue because it provided the, we'll call it credit, mm-hmm. um, the, the means of borrowing money in order to import because the system was so inefficient mm. and, 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 and so ruled by terror that it, it destroyed human initiative mm-hmm. um, in, in most areas. So um, it wasn't that the Russians or later the Chinese or, or others didn't didn't have the ability to um, invent things and develop them and, and, and run very successful factories. It was that they, they were so oppressed that they had no means of doing it. Mm. They were ruled by the gun. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and here in the West, we were presented with the, that country as being a great enemy and wanting to take over the world. And sure, the communists did did have that objective. They're globalists. Mm -hmm. They're the revolutionary um, outcome of that highly centralized banking system because those movements, even today, they get a good press. Mm -hmm. Um, George Soros is never exposed. He, he funnels billions of dollars, mm. hundreds of millions of dollars and more to various protest movements, all of them against what we would say those aspects of society that are influenced by Christianity. Mm -hmm. um, and it just basically provides stability mm. um, to individuals and communities. He, mm -hmm. he, he funds protests. Um, I don't believe he's the top of the ladder. I think he's well down from the top of the ladder because... <clears throat> the financial he wouldn't be rich if it wasn't for the financial op oligarchs wanting him to be rich yeah yeah and he wouldn't be able to do the things he he does unless he was fulfilling the function that those people have been oligarchs for a very long time generational mm -hmm. um if he wasn't carrying out or operating in a way that was serving their interests mm. so so i see the mm. i see the um I, I agree with what you're saying about Soros and, if you like, the left of politics. But I also see that the right of politics falls into exactly the same trap. And that is that, is that, is that they, they are prepared to endorse the inheritance for their own families. But they won't endorse the inheritance for every family the cultural inheritance that is being appropriated by the banking system. They won't do it. And the thing is that the left wing turn around and they say, well, no one deserves to have any inheritance at all except for the state. And when the state has it, of course, power corrupts and, and there you've got a, another tyrant. And uh, and so I, I see the, if you like, the right of politics and I'll, my view of the right is essentially the Murdoch, the Murdoch empire. He's to me presents the... the um, general conservative point of view, and yet they will not touch. They will not touch the banking system. They will not touch the money power. And so this mainstream media, the left and the right, the left and the right just fight with each other, and they're meant to because that's part of the Marxist dialectic. And and the fact is that the only time we'll find resolution to this is the same is the same time as when we find resolution to this question of power, of where power should reside. And uh, and I know that in the in history gone by, 800 years ago, we celebrated the, um, recently celebrated 800 years since Magna Carta. The seal was placed on that. But the fact is that Magna Carta took hundreds of years. The first Carta, the first charter was signed at 1100. Magna Carta 1215 didn't become common law until 1295. That was over nearly 200 years it took just to get into the common law. That was a, a blue that went on for 200 years. And there's no way, Jose, that we have the same freedoms now that they had then. And, and we're losing more and more every day. And the point comes back to these are ancient freedoms. These are ancient freedoms. And it's going to take just as much resolve to get these freedoms back as it did then. And when it comes down to it, the vote, OK, we've got the vote. But the fact is that our governments don't represent us. They're more like human resources to manage us between us and the oligarchs, us and the banking system. And what we need is we need something like the money vote. We need to actually emasculate, get that ring ring thing on those on those testicles of the of the bull called the financial system <laughs> and, and, and get it get it on them. And, uh, and get this money vote back where it belongs, which is in the hands of the individuals in community. So that when we can take the initiative and get an industry going and be self-reliant and independent, resourceful, we can get an industry going that at the same time there's sufficient spending power in the community to buy what the industry makes. That equilibrium is what's missing and that's what Douglas was on about with this money vote. Absolutely. Absolutely. You, you mentioned Magna Carta. My own view is that we've been denied access to the history of our European heritage, mm -hmm. so we know very little about it. But Magna Carta must have come out of, of a particular environment whereby a large number of people, including those in the clergy, mm -hmm. those 
administering the affairs of state. Mm -hmm. um, society was not as highly centralized as it is in our day. But nevertheless, for Magna Carta to have emerged in that period indicates that the general thinking was that these things are important and that the, um, for instance, something in the Magna Carta says that one of the uh, um, rules, if you like, in, in Magna Carta is that if someone wants to pay their tax in kind, they can. Mm -hmm. So someone who grows, I don't know, tulips mm -hmm. and they want to pay their tax, well, they, they just got to hand on to the landlord or the or the or the king the prince mm -hmm. um, a whole bunch of tulips 10 percent of what he's produced or something like that mm -hmm. and i think that that's a way of keeping the pollies a little bit under control and, and mm. letting them know that listen this is what we're going to do if, you, if you're going to allow the banks to foster forced upon us uh, a financial system that's going to destroy us and harm us and harm mm -hmm. our families and communities um and it's not issuing the, the money we require, the, mm -hmm. the amounts, we'll give you um, taxes in kind. Mm -hmm. There's a really practical aspect to that, um, but also a political message as well. If somebody might have had the money at times and not happy with what, what his um, landlord was doing, mm -hmm. he, he, he could say, well, here's, here's 20 bales of hay, you know, yeah. that's 10% that's of what I've produced and, and that's what I'm due to pay and, and, mm -hmm. and, and that's it. Mm -hmm. But taxes were much lower. Mm -hmm. um, um, from what I, I've been able to discover, um, and the ten percent or tithe, mm. um, that that covered covered everything. That mm. covered your contribution to the church. It, it covered your contribution to the maintenance of a, the local bridges and roads, and, mm -hmm. and they did have these things. They had transport mm. systems limited mm -hmm. from our perspective, but they existed. People people travelled around a little bit, mm -hmm. a big bit in some cases, mm. and. Um, have you ever read William Cobbett? I know we're getting off track. I think we should have an episode where we talk about William Cobbett. Okay. Well, I think I've got. Focused on. I think I've got. I think I've got three of his books there. I think Set yeah. in the Silver Sea. Um, no, no, that's Sir Arthur Bryant. Okay. Well, then I don't. I don't know William Cobbett. No. Oh, I might I have do. some books, but I. I don't remember them. C.H. Uh, C. H. Douglas referred to Cobbett as perhaps the greatest Englishman of last century. Okay. Righto. And. Um, and he, he saw through the farce of the financial system too. He, he, mm. he said, we're, we're in a rich country and and, mm -hmm. um, and and why is there so many poor people? Yeah. But he was at the time, we're just leading up to, I think he died shortly after Queen Victoria came to the throne and he was a monarchist. Mm -hmm. And he was, he pushed for the return of the, of the position of the monarchy. Um, but he referred back to the period of 11, 1200s and, and, and looked at what a, a labourer might, Earn and for, for less hours, a, a labourer, <laughs> you, you could hardly eat all the food that was provided and, yeah. and the beer that was provided, and they didn't work long long days. They generally worked a, a portion of a day because they had yeah. other responsibilities. Yeah. And and sometimes uh, um, people volunteered for things like the building of castles or cathedrals, mm -hmm. uh, and they, they'd get paid with. Um, they often got paid, but they got paid quite well, and and and. Um, and, and provided with beer and, and, and stuff yeah. like that at the yeah. end of the day as well. But they worked less hours and yeah. then they'd go back to their little farms to do their farm work. Yeah. Um, they had that kind of independence. It, it, not like we've got today where um, a, a person does not have that degree of independence. Yeah. But William yeah. Cobbett is, is amazing. He um, travelled around England and um, I think we really could have a good session on him and it'll, it'll get me to, to review some of the stuff I've read about him in the past, and there is a William Cobbett Society. Okay, well that's that's a that's a valid point. I um, I'm going to have to go and have a look and see if with what we've got of William Cobbett in our library, um, a book that I'm reading just started to read at the moment. It's been sitting on the shelf for a long time, and I finally got my own copy. It's called The Law of Civilization and Decay: An Essay on History by Brooks Adams, and in it I've only read the first couple of chapters. But in the in the chapters, it's it's explaining how debt and usurious debt, debt, but enslaved nations for centuries. They enslaved nations for centuries. Now we're watching, you know, we're watching European nations go. We look at uh, name Greece, Portugal, Italy, Spain, Ireland. You know, all these nations are are essentially they're losing their assets through debt 
through the through the debt. And and the fact is that this inordinate power that banks have over, and yet the countries themselves. I mean, Greece, come on, it's on the Mediterranean. What are we talking about here? You know, you've got a, an idyllic environment, a climate. It's not like it's it's snowed in for six months of the year or something like that. And it's a, it's a, it's a place of milk and honey. And yet financially, they're destitute. And uh, I find that absolutely extraordinary. And that's the, that's the anomaly that's going on. It's not actually, the financial system is not reflecting the abundance that is there. The bounty that is there. Where where we live, we've got a backyard that's just uh, with the rains that we're having and spring and the fruit trees and that. It's just absolutely bountiful what we have. And we're only on a block of land, but it's absolutely bountiful. And if we were commercial growers, we'd be going through the roof with what's going on at the moment. And it doesn't reflect it in our level of indebtedness. We've got a bounty of abundance. We've got an abundance. We've got plenty of everything. But the financial system says we're broke and it says we're indebted and we've got to um, uh, lease out our ports for 99 years and lease out our power systems and our power lines and our telecommunications and our water systems. Tolls are placed on our highways and our bridges all because the financial system says that we're what? What words do they use? Living beyond our means? I mean, come on, we built the things. We built the things. We well, built. There's obviously, a, there's obviously a tier of people that uh, I've come to think of them as the global mafia, mm-hmm. and they have access um, through whatever means to large amounts of money that they can borrow from the bankers, mm-hmm. and then they can buy government assets and say, "Well, you know, we can afford. We've got, we've got this billion dollars. We can buy your railway. We can buy your transport system. We can buy your hydro power station, or mm-hmm. at least lease it for 99 years." And they become a, a middleman between another layer of the of middleman, and and they get huge profits out of these things. Mm-hmm. But um, we had a company, an international company, running one of the prisons, and and it got into such a mess here in Auckland, New Zealand, that um, the government had to take it over as as an emergency thing. And I, I I'm not aware that that company got any um, financial penalties, mm-hmm. um, had to pay back some money or anything like that. They were obviously being well paid. Who's behind these organisations? Mm. Large companies, some of these semi-hidden large companies, they they push for centralisation of power, getting rid of small councils. We only have big councils. Mm-hmm. Um, our previous prime minister, up till not too long ago, John Key was a great supporter of the um, what's it T TPP Trans Pacific yeah. Partnership. Yeah, yeah, the only partnership involved in is 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 is, is these oligarchs hidden finance globalist oligarchs with mm-hmm. with um, access to large amounts of, of money um, joining hands that's the only partnership that's going on and then mm-hmm. they, they they take over assets base basically they, they rape countries like Australia and New Zealand and elsewhere that's right in the same way that the Russians had their assets public government assets public assets stripped almost bare after the fall of communism, the country was just, the word rape is the, is the only description of it. It was just mm-hmm. totally raped. Mm. And uh, you had well over half the population uh, below the poverty level. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and fortunately, they've pulled themselves up from that. And, and in my view, they have some members of government, and I think President Putin is in that category. He's influenced by the traditions of the country. I would like to see a real campaign to 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 fix the financial system. Yeah. Um, they're still pushing the general economic Western nonsense mm-hmm. um, on economics and finance, mm-hmm. and um, they're avoiding going into the levels of debt. We are by, I think, good management mm. and the export of oil and the large, high price of oil these days. Mm-hmm. But, um, and of course, they're becoming major exporters of food, wheat and other products as well. Yeah. Um, but nevertheless, they still push this thing that the purpose of life is, is full employment, or, mm. along with, um, fortunately, some changes in Hungary, Poland as well. Mm. Um, some emphasis um, through financial help, um, tax help for f- families. Mm-hmm. Um, the West isn't doing that. We've gone the other way. We, we don't put any value on family 
and family life or community and, yeah, and yeah. traditional values at all. We're, we're mm -hmm. ripping that apart or allowing it to be ripped apart mm -hmm. in the West. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. That's right. There's certainly a, a long way to go, Bill. And um, and no doubt there'll be plenty of us to plenty of subjects for us to talk about in the coming year. And uh, I, I want to uh, bring this to to a close, but I really really appreciate your input. And I appreciate your contribution. This time for a yarn has been a lot of fun. And um, and no doubt we're going to cover some good subjects in the new year. So thank you so much for joining us, Bill, and being part of our uh, uh, time for a yarn with Uncle Bill and Barney the Ram. Well, I want to wish you, you Barney, a very wonderful Christmas <laughs> and uh, <laughs> a good rest under a gorse hedge or whatever whatever it is that turns you on. <laughs> no worries. All right. Too easy, bud. You take care. And, God bless. Uh, and, and God bless you too. We'll catch yeah. you in the new year. All right. Cheerio, ladies and gentlemen. Thank